Hi everyone, nice to meet you. Cool. How are you today? Good? Nice. So today I will walk you through and hopefully out the digital maids. So for digital maids, I mean uh, today customer journey. If you think about it, uh, as uh, consumers, there is so much information, so many choices, uh, so many channels, competitors. So it's easy to get lost, right? And our job as uh, marketing managers is actually helping people get out the uh, digital maze. This is how I define it. So if we take a step back, right? Uh, the customer journey before the internet was pretty simple. So I take the example of Giovanni, Italian, looking to buy a fork to eat his spaghetti, right? So uh, the, the first thing he was going to do is see the ad for the first time on a billboard, the new fork. Uh, and then he will go on the shop, find it on the shelf, and eventually use it to eat his uh, spaghetti, right? Uh, it's not racist because I'm Italian, so I can say it, yeah? Cool. So that was a pretty simple uh, journey, right? And then, of course, the internet came. Uh, Google defined it as the zero moment of truth, which is actually all the information we have online, right? So uh, before, uh, between seeing the ad for the first time and actually um, going to the shop and buy it, there is a lot of research, right? So Giovanni can go online and actually, you know, uh, read uh, blogs around the uh, fork, can check what his friends are, are doing with, the, with, with that fork. He can uh, go, you know, on YouTube and watch videos and etc. right? So, so much information, right? And then today, Giovanni is not just looking, you know, for information, but then he's actually doing a TikTok and showing his friends how to use the fork, right? So he's also becoming an influencer, and he's actually getting back, right? So now, uh, Giovanni is not just a final user, but he's also like um, a marketing manager in, in, in himself, right? So as you can see, right, we moved from a very linear customer journey to actually like a very confusing one. Um, because, you know, this is the modern customer journey. So, so many touch points, uh, there is no clarity, so much information. And for brands, it's very hard to be remembered, right? To control the experience and to make sure that people move from awareness to conversion, if you want, right? Google defined it as the messy middle. So essentially, uh, we, we're moving from a cone-shaped funnel where you add, I mean, to keep it simple, awareness, consideration, and conversion, to actually like, you know, like a, a, a circle uh, shape uh, where, you know, people move from the exposure to the experience, but they constantly moving from exploration to evaluation. So you're exploring new alternatives and you evaluate new alternatives as well, right? And yeah, so I define this as the digital maze because it's easy uh, for people to get lost. So our job as a marketing managers is to help people get out of the maze. So I highlighted three keys to exit the maze. So if we use these three keys in a very simple way, we allow the uh, user to get out of the uh, maze, which is always on campaigns, opti-channel approach, and a full funnel strategy. I will walk you through each of these keys in a second, but before getting into that, let's take a step back and let's um, analyze how brands grow, right? Byron Sharp says that uh, brands grow by focusing on building mental availability and physical availability, right? Uh, mental availability refers to the likelihood of people uh, to remember and think of your brand during a purchase decision. So simply, I work for Lipton. If I'm thinking about tea, uh, I think about Lipton. Or if Giovanni is looking, is thinking about fork, is thinking about the new fork, right? Then physical or digital, I would say, availability is uh, how easily Giovanni, the consumer, can find the product when looking for it, right? So. In this case is, can Giovanni find the new fork on the shelf when looking for it, right? So I usually give the example of, if I would like to have a Coke, right? I go to the, the, the shop and I, and I ask for a Coke. If they don't have it and they have Pepsi, I might just buy Pepsi, right? 
So for brands, it's important to make sure that uh, people remember you and think of you when thinking about your category, if you want. But then they need to be able to find you when they into the category uh, uh, searching as well, right? And then there is another uh, um, uh, thing that defined by Byron Sharp as the love of buyer moderation. So every buyer users, every buyers will buy less over time, while light users and non-users uh, will start buying over time. Uh, and this has been shown, like for example, for uh, Coca-Cola, uh, uh, actually 50% of uh, Coca-Cola buyers only buy and drink Coke one or twice a year, which means that 50% of Coke buyers don't really drink Coke, right? They are not loyal customers. And this has been shown also for a uh, service industry as well, so like for a law firm. This means that growth is, is about getting more people to buy what you do. It's not just about getting people buy more, but it's actually reaching everyone. So uh, we need to target, so this is the first uh, takeaway here. We need to target broad audiences to reach all buyers. Because as you can see, most of the market is non-buyers and light buyers. By focusing only on heavy buyers, you're just looking at a small part of the, the picture, right? So this is the first key here, right? So the first key is always on campaigns to target a broad audience to build mental availability. So making sure that people think of you when thinking about the category, the best way to do it is make sure you're always on and they see you often. Because in a society where you know, there is a lot of quantity, it's, it's good to make sure that people remember you, right? So you know, delivering the always on message. Um, if you think about it, there are studies that say that 95% of our brain works for shortcuts. So we're very lazy, actually. So we usually take the uh, quickest decision, the fastest decision, right? So the best way to, to, to do that is making sure we, we're there. Uh, there are studies that prove that always on presence, of course, increase mental availability and the brand recall. So there is a correlation, of course, uh, between awareness and uh, buying intent. So if you, if you put together the always-on approach plus a consistent message, I think this is where you win, right? And we have great examples here. You have Nike, Red Bull, uh, Adidas. They always repeat the same message. Now, they have enough money to change the message every hour, right? But they keep a consistent message and an always-on presence because it's easier to remember. Then the second key is opti-channel uh, campaigns to build uh, the uh, physical and digital availability, right? Why I say opti-channel? Opti-channel, in my opinion, is a mix of, of course, you want to be multi-channel because you want to be on different channels, but then you want to be omni-channel because you want to have a consistent uh, approach across all the uh, channels, but then in my opinion, we should be opti-channel, so you should choose the optimum channel for you, which means being where you can be, be where your you, uh, where final consumer is, be where you can afford to be as well. So to give you an example, one of our brands is Paca, right? You might see Paca on a billboard in, in the London uh, underground, but then if you're searching for Paca herbs on the Tesco website, you need to make sure to find us, right? Because if you don't find us through organic presence and the paid presence as well to protect ourselves from competitors, making sure we list on the top of the search engine result page, then you either don't buy us or buy, or buy competitors, right? In other words, if you can't see it, you can buy it. I really like this, sorry. Just... <laughs> and then the last key is a full funnel uh, campaigns to close the gap between the trigger and the purchase. So you remember like the uh, circle shape, right? Uh, funnel. So of course, we're still, we're still looking at it in a, in a cone shape because it's easier to draw, it's easier to work on it. But if you think about it, for people, it's easy to get lost, you know? between awareness and conversion. So a full funnel approach allows you to constantly move people from uh, top of funnel to bottom funnel, right? Um, so yeah, see, because we move constantly from exploration to evaluation. So, you know, making sure you constantly move people, I think it's the key there. Um, so yeah, like summing up, I feel like message consistency plus mental availability and physical availability, I think this is what really uh, makes people buy our product and uh, 
makes them exit the digital maids, right? So summing up, I feel like to solve the messy middle, which is today customer journey, uh, we need to have always on campaigns to build mental availability, uh, opti-channel campaigns to build physical and digital availability, uh, full funnel to close the gap between you know, awareness and conversion, and then everything with a clear and distinctive and consistent information across all the touch points. So I think message consistency is the key there. Um, so yeah, uh, will you manage to get uh, your user out of the journey and the maids? Thank, thank you, guys. Great presentation. Is it on? I can project anyway. Um, great presentation, as I'm sure everyone will agree, and a bit of a whirlwind through everything. So I just want to deep dive into some of the points that we touched on. So starting with the content and the sort of three touch points that you talked about to help exit the maze, can you talk to me a little bit more about why always on and what you see as kind of best practice in activating that as a strategy? Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, I didn't really discover and I didn't really present uh, nothing new, right? I mean, always on campaigns, opti-channel, you know, multi-channel, uh, full funnel. It's, I mean, it's pretty simple. I feel like sometimes, I mean, from my experience, I started my career agency side. Now I'm, I moved to the dark side, aka the client side, right? And I feel like sometimes we spend so much time in planning. So I give you an example, right? When I was agency side, I had a client that will send me a brief take like one month to respond to the brief, uh, then go live with the campaign, be live, I don't know, like one month, two months, and then, by the way, the algorithm takes up to three weeks to learn, and then post the campaign, uh, build a post-campaign analysis, which takes another month to deliver, and then learn and get, get back to, to another campaign, which you're losing a lot of visibility, uh, and the algorithm doesn't learn, so I feel like, Always on is important because uh, algorithm need, need, uh, takes time to learn first. Secondly, I feel like every campaign is not just a performance campaign, but it's actually a market research campaign as well. Because you can test different hypotheses, you can uh, test different audiences, you can build audiences based on, on certain things. So always on presence allow you to build you know, mental availability, uh, but at the same time allows you to have a continuous uh, in, influx of data that you can use to inform the business as well. It's really important, I think, that informing the business and coming around there. And I'm going to skip to another question that I've got. So we've got those three approaches. So we've got always on, we've got OptiChannel, we've got full funnel. Like you said, not necessarily nothing new, but maybe thinking about doing it in a more strategic way. How do we as marketeers ensure consistency across those approaches that might be being activated if we're in a big organization by different teams? Yeah, um, and this is where probably like playbooks uh, play a role. And I, I don't really like playbooks because, again, we spend so much time and work building playbooks and then uh, someone leaves the company, some, someone else uh, uh, joins the company and they forget about all the playbooks and everything. But I feel like having uh, actually some rules, right, in terms of like, uh, because I feel like if you work with agencies, uh, they have big turnovers. They have people that come and go, right? So uh, in my opinion, it's the client in this case should have a clear objectives. So making sure you have your rules in terms of who your audience is, what's your message, what's your style, and just make sure that you respect that over, over time, I would say. Um, but I keep it simple, I would say, because I think also, and we were discussing this before, I feel like, in a society where, of course, there is a lot of technology, we can do so many things, we can measure so many things, I feel like sometimes we get lost in testing so much, uh, measuring too much, where you can actually keep it simple, focus on your story, uh, focus on storytelling, focus on the right creativity, reach everyone, make sure that you're actually having an impact on that, you know? Do, doing the basics, but do it well, instead of you know, trying to do 10 things at the same time, I would say. Yeah, it's that over-optimizing to the point of diminishing returns and actually where are you, where's the value going to come from? And there's this bit of a broader question, which is in businesses and even in teams, there can be so many competing orientations. So some people are worried about the cu customer, some people are worried about competitors, some people are really focused on product. And how do you stay 
super focused on the consumer when all the other distractions are happening. Yeah, no, it's a great point. I usually say my job is 50% I'm a psychologist and 50% I'm a digital marketing manager. Uh, it's not easy and you know my role is translating the business objective in media, right? So of course I need to look at the media KPIs. Uh, the business variables, uh, metrics, KPI change uh, almost every week. Uh, so I think the key is to be transparent, communicate, show what is working. I think education is also very important because, uh, believe it or not, a lot of people are not media experts, but they need to work with you, right? So, like for example, what I did uh, like last year within Lipton, I started doing internal training. So, because like my second job is I teach at university. So, what I started to do is I took the approach of university and I took it back to. Uh, work because I feel like probably the biggest mistake is that in the past you finish university and you like okay now I can quit studying I can just get job and go on with my life where today it, it, it's not true anymore like you need to keep studying so I feel like keeping a conversation studying being open because some people are also afraid to be like sorry I'm not sure what uh, CTR means, right? So just being honest, be like, look, guys, this is what I'm seeing. This is your, the business objective. Let's have an open discussion and let's, yeah, be honest. I think that's a really good point, like taking people on the journey with you and teaching them what you're doing. Um, okay, so zooming out a bit, you just mentioned that you're lecturing at a university and looking sort of at the personal and the professional. So you head up e-commerce for Lipton, you lecture at that university, and you're running a YouTube channel, which you'll all see a bit about in a minute. Um, what drives you with your work and your life? Like, what drives you to do this rather than to just turn up at your day job and kind of do it how it's been done for the last five years? Yeah, um, I mean, of, of course, uh, there is a passion. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't do it. Um, but yeah, I think the drivers are different, of course, you know, like education, university, it's easy, right? Because it's the driver is helping people be part of their life, even if it's a very small percentage. Uh, but yeah, I would say it's a passion. It's a lot of energy and you have to put it somewhere, right? And I also feel like when you work on, the, on different things at the same time, I think you learn a lot because uh, surprisingly enough, I learn a lot uh, about digital marketing while teaching. Because they usually say, if you know how to do it, you do it. If you don't know how to do it, you teach it, right? I, I, I don't know if it's true, because I feel like the moment you start teaching and explaining and reading, uh, students can be mean, because they can ask the right question, you know, and they, you know. So I think being able to just to keep studying, it's a good excuse if you're if you, if you teaching, right? Uh, so yeah, I would say pa passion, and uh, I get bored pretty easily, so I need to, you know, move fast, yeah, I will say. You kind of set me up for this question, which is what are some interesting things you've learned recently? You mean in general? like In general or within the digital marketing space? <laughs> uh, what I learned? I learned that uh, in digital marketing, there are not really there are not really right and wrong things. Like, of course, there are very wrong things, but there are a lot of best practice. And I feel like you always need to listen and learn from the others. Because, like, for example, when, I, when I'm at uni, I give briefs to students that are very similar to briefs that we have on a daily basis. And I actually realize that sometimes they can have a point of view, a fresh point of view. Uh, they, ca they can share some insights. They can, like, easily uh, find solutions that you never... Uh, to, uh, you never thought of. So, yeah, I think, like, just uh, shut up and listen. <laughs> it's a good lesson, I think, for most of us. So your remit at Lipton covers Europe. So how are you seeing behaviour evolving across different European countries in this kind of di digital maze, and how can we adapt? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a good point. I mean, if, if we focus on grocery shopping, because at the end of the day, uh, we're selling tea online, which is mostly gro grocery shopping. So uh, in Europe, I'm seeing like very different trends. So for example, I'm Italian, as you, as you can tell. But like uh, in Italy, for example, people still want to go to small shops, uh, touch the product. Uh, you know, talk to people. So it's more like experiential, I would say. Um, so we still buy 
less online compared to the UK, for example, where you don't just have like, you know, Tesco, all the retailers online, right? So like Tesco, Sainsbury, Asda, but then you also have aggregators. So you have Ocado, etc. So for example, in UK, I think it's, it's probably the best country in, in Europe in terms of like, you know, technology. Uh, and yeah, I feel like, um, everything is becoming like a search engine here. So like, you know, like you need to be there. Uh, people are buying offline, but people are buying a lot online. So of course, Amazon is the big player, but like we actually seeing a very good ROAS on uh, uh, retailers, right? So I think retailers have a big role to play in the future, because if you think about it, marketing uh, really didn't change. It's just the medium change, right? So even like offline shopping, it's the same as on, on, online shopping. It's, it's very similar. The only thing is, in the past, you were fighting for the same shelf, where today you have uh, unlimited shelves because every person sees uh, like a different shelf, right? So it's, it's more fun from a marketing uh, perspective. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's evolving fast. So you see UK uh, dominating, other countries are following. But I feel like Italy, Germany, Netherlands, France will follow the same, right? So it's just a matter of uh, when we get there. But at the same time, I feel like it's, you know, the retailers are evolving as well. Because I feel like now, like Tesco and all the others look like Google Ads of 20 years ago. But like they will evolve soon, so they will have display. They they will have probably better DSPs. So I think we will get to a point where it will be more fun for for the user as well. It's really interesting, I think, to look at the different country differences and how often with your kind of always on approach. So you've got always on, you've got opti channel, and you've got your full funnel. So to not do the model that you described as kind of not working, which is running a campaign for a couple of weeks, stopping it seeing what happens, starting another one, but to leave it as always on, how regularly are you then looking at what's working and optimizing? Yeah, like on the always on uh, approach, I give you an example. We reached a point where there was this bond where it wasn't, it, that was summer, so pr you don't really sell much tea in summer, at least, you know, in other countries. And um, we had a very minimum budget and, uh, you know, everyone wanted to pause it, right? They said, look, we only have, I don't know, it was like less than 20K. So they were like, let's pause it and put the budget in Q4. And I was like, let's keep it because you don't want the algorithm to stop learning because it's like, you know, it's like now we all are aware of machine learning and how it works, right? If you pause it for a month, you need to start from scratch. So I was like, I would rather keep it live with a very minimum budget, but we keep it on. So I think that was one learning, for example. Uh, and the other approach is, of course, at the moment, I'm very focused on e-com. But I always said, uh, to grow e-com, you also need to grow it outside of Amazon and retailers, because uh, people live outside of uh, Tesco.com and Amazon.com, right? So you need to build demand, you know, build the mental availability outside of that, and monetize it with physical and digital availability within the retailer. Really interesting. Um, and then coming back to kind of the multi-passionate, kind of multi-hyphenate person that you are doing lots of different things. We were talking about it outside, like how do you balance that kind of day job with starting something new and doing a podcast and um, all the other things that you're doing. Kind of how do you find the time and then also while you're also making sure that you're still kind of upskilling and staying ahead of the game? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point. I feel like upskilling is part of the first thing, right? If you do many things, you keep upskilling. Because like, the moment I started the, the video podcast, I needed to study, you know, how lighting works, cameras, microphones. So it's another job, and I think you start respecting content creators a little bit more because it's it's a full time job actually. So when you see people like delivering a reel that actually finish and starts in the, at the same in the same way, guys, it's it's a job like uh, to build a reel like you take five hours. It, if you think about it, if an influencer wakes up in the morning and they need to come up with the idea, record it, edit it, and publish it, yeah, I think it takes like seven hours minimum. Uh, but yeah, no, I feel like it's, and uh, we talked about this in my in the third episode of uh, the uh, video podcast, uh, We move. I'm, I think I'm moving from uh, work-life balance to work-life integration, right? So I think you just need to integrate it, uh, have fun, so probably you have more fun like recording a video than not just you know optimizing uh, uh, keywords probably, uh, but yeah it's just finding you know integrate passions 
and and work. You know, some people say find your passion and uh, you know make it your job and you you never work. Well, I think it's not like that. I think you end up uh, hating uh, your <laughs> your passion. <laughs> but I think yeah, finding a balance. Uh, but maybe integration is the key. Yeah. Yeah, someone that became a yoga teacher because I thought that was my passion. I then hated <laughs> teaching yoga and I'm back here working in marketing. Um, I think it's a really good point though and that the content creation has made me think of another line. Like how do you stay in... So you're running this strategy as part of your kind of head of e-commerce media role. How do you stay aligned with the influencer team, with what everyone else is doing and make sure it's integrated? Yeah, just making sure that we catch up like probably once a month and share the same point of view, I would say, but then everyone has their job, so it's very hard to be aligned. I feel like the message consistency is key, right? Because so if the e-com channel is saying, I don't know, drink tea because it makes you live longer, I don't know, we, we, we don't say that, but it's an example. <laughs> uh, then make sure that influencers and all the others repeat the same message. So uh, you make sure that, you know, there is consistency, like people, right? You want to be consistent. So of course I'm different than when I'm home, but I'm not that different, you know? I always try to be consistent as well. Right? So I feel like consistency is the key. So again, you know when you have your brand guidelines, I think you should have your media guidelines as well, right? I think it's a good point, and sometimes it's a gap we see, right, with not having media guidelines. I think we've only got time for one more question, so I'll ask my final one, which is circling back to the consumer. If people take one thing away from mastering the consumer journey and the mess messy middle, what do you think it would be? Yeah, I would say keep it simple. Focus on storytelling, because uh, I mean, of course, I'm more like on the media side, but I feel like in a world where these platforms are becoming easier to use, uh, in some ways, those platforms are trying to kill the agencies, right? Because, like, you know, like today you have a Performance Max campaign on Google, you have, you know, uh, I feel like Google now is creating uh, ads uh, for you as well. Like Facebook is doing uh, the same, YouTube is doing the same. So those platforms are becoming much easier. So I feel like the creative part is becoming a key uh, because beside, uh, behind those clicks there are people and people focus on the story, people focus on the uh, creative side. So I would say keep it simple. As you, as you notice, like I didn't really, I, I didn't really present uh, something new. It's just always on full funnel, opti channel, which is, you know, like, sounds like a religion, but like, it's pretty simple, right? So yeah, keep it simple and focus on the story you want to tell. Great. Thank you, Gio. And thanks everyone for listening. I know that you've got your podcast, which is a glass of marketing with Gio, and it's a kind of a video podcast. So it's on YouTube. Did you want to flick through? Yeah, to show you the everyone? intro if you want to subscribe. So essentially, we drink wine and we talk about marketing. So, so we should have had wine here, but we didn't have wine today. <laughs>